Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth of our six session uh, webinar series providing healthcare in a pandemic. I'm Lisa Green. I'm a program coordinator for the Western New York Rural Area Health Education Center. Um, our webinar series, which was of course developed to support our healthcare and service providers who have faced multiple challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic um, is almost complete. We only have this session and next, next week's session. So um, we're almost complete. We've had some great sessions. Uh, every session is available on the website um, so far. The recordings um, have all been completed and edited, ready for you to view uh, the session. This session today will be recorded and next week's session will be recorded and they'll all be available as long as you need them. Um, if you would like a specific session without having to go to the website, you can always email me. Um, I, my email is right there on the screen, lgreen at r-ahack.org. Um, today's session topic is treatment of COVID-19 and other infectious diseases of public health importance. Um, and it will be an overview of current treatments for COVID-19 and screening treatment strategies for other communicable diseases, including sexually transmitted infections, HIV and hepatitis C during the pandemic. Um, so before we meet our presenters, uh, we always have a little homework to do here. Um, the chat box is open, so please introduce yourselves there. And again, if you have any questions during the presentations, go ahead and put them in the chat box. We would be glad to answer them um, as they come up. Um, also, as always, feel free to leave the webinar when you need to and access the recordings um, when it's convenient for you. Um, and don't forget to visit our website after and fill out that evaluation page for us. Um, it really helps us to make our future webinars as good as they can possibly be. Um, so again, if you have any follow-up questions, you'd like to contact any one of our presenters, uh, my email, again, is lgreen at r-ahack.org, um, or you can call me at that number on the screen, and we'd be glad to help you out and put you in touch with our um, presenters. So let's go ahead and introduce um, who we have presenting today. We have Dr. Daniela DeMarco, who is an infectious disease physician specializing in STIs and HIV and assistant professor of medicine at the University of Rochester Medical Center. Uh, she is a content expert for the URMC Center for Community Practice, CDC funded capacity building assistance program for high impact HIV prevention, which is a mouthful. <laughs> Um, and a faculty expert and frequent speaker for the New York State AIDS Institute Clinical Education Initiative Sexual Health Center of Excellence. So welcome, Daniela. Can you give us a wave? Okay, we also have David Dobrzynski. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, David. You're right. <laughs> awesome. Um, he received his Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from Becknell University. Um, and his doctorate of medicine from Albany Medical College. He completed his internal medicine residency at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, he continued on as faculty at Wake Forest as an assistant chief of medicine for the following year. And he then went on to complete his infectious diseases fellowship at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. He joined the faculty of URMC in 2018 and currently sees inpatients on the General Infectious Diseases Consult Service, as well as outpatients in the General Infectious Diseases uh, Clinic. He also serves as medical director for the anti, I'm sorry, the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program and program director of the Infectious Diseases Fellowship Program at Strong Memorial Hospital. So welcome to both of you. David, I see that you're still experiencing some technical difficulties. Yeah, no video, so I can, unfortunately can't wave, so I apologize, <laughs> but I am waving no in for it. <laughs> no problem. Um, I will go ahead and turn my screen over to uh, David. So we should be able to see uh, my slides now. Yep. Um, so uh, thanks to Lisa and everyone organizing this. Uh, Danielle and I are obviously very happy uh, to be here and, and 
and share some uh, information about uh, COVID-19 and other uh, communicable diseases, obviously during a pandemic. Um, so a little bit about what I'll talk about uh, today. Um, I'm a little, I'm the program director of the stewardship program. So I'll talk a little bit about antimicrobial stewardship, um, kind of as a background about how I got involved um, in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, through the therapeutics. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the therapeutic options that are, are currently available and were initially studied uh, earlier in the spring and why they're no longer available. And then a little bit about what the future of COVID-19 therapeutics holds. Um, so I always like to start this out by talking a little about antibiotic stewardship. And I think, you know, we all know the antibiotics have really been transformative for medicine over the last century. Um, but over the years, um, unfortunately, decades of misuse has led to a lot of unnecessary antibiotics uh, that are being used. And I think the CDC put out this estimate about two years ago that they think about 30% of antibiotics are unnecessary or are suboptimal. And if you look here um, on, the, on the right, I show a list of antibiotics, a couple of them that the year they were introduced and then the year when we first discovered resistance. Um, and early on, it took you know, many decades for resistance to, to develop. But over the, cent over the past couple of decades, um, that, that gap has really been closing. And now it's even less than a year that we're seeing resistance uh, develop. You couple that with a big discovery void in antibiotics and we, and we got the current um, uh, problem um, I used to say it was the next uh, pandemic that was going to happen was antimicrobial resistance. Obviously, that's been proven wrong with COVID-19, um, but this is still an ongoing problem um, that our, our nation and our global um, uh, infectious disease community faces. So because of this, the CDC had a call to action, um, and they really um, put out four core actions, preventing infections and the spread of resistance, uh, tracking these resistant bacteria, um, improving the use of today's antibiotics, and then also promoting the development of, of new antibiotics and new diagnostic tests. Um, and President Obama in 2015 was the first president to put out a fiscal budget um, allocating resources for antibiotic stewardship, um, mostly through strengthening the risk assessment and reporting, um, but then also looking at other sectors like the health and agricultural sectors. Um, and I really like this, this is actually a, a figure from the um, Global Alliance for Infections and Surgery. <clears throat> and it's a great um, model for it shows you how really multifaceted antimicrobial stewardship has become uh, in today's world. Um, it's actually been around for a long time. The stewardship programs were actually first described uh, by two Emory physicians in the late uh, mid to late 90s. Um, and they really suggested that large scale well controlled trials for antibiotic use really need are needed in this um, in order for us to prevent this problem. Um, a year later, SHEA, which is the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America and IDSA, which is the Infectious Disease Society of America, published their first guidelines to prevent antimicrobial resistance. And um, those have continued to evolve. Um, in 2014, the CDC recommended that all US hospitals have to have an antimicrobial stewardship program uh, for inpatients. Um, and really, this was further uh, regulated by the Joint Commission, uh, which um, approved regulations for all hospitals to have a stewardship team. So what do stewardship programs do? So it's really, I think, pretty simple, um, but obviously it's, it's multifaceted and, and can be complex, but really we're here to optimize the treatment of infections. Um, obviously we realize the antibiotics need to be used, so we want to reduce the adverse events associated with antibiotic use. We want to help clinicians obviously improve the quality of care of patients. We want to improve patient safe, safety, and hopefully through these initiatives, we can cut hospital rates of C. diff and antimicrobial resistance. Um, I put these, these are the core principles of antimicrobial stewardship. Um, and again, I think the nice thing is about up here in upstate New York, pretty much every hospital system um, has leadership commitment, accountability, um, some form of drug expertise. And then, uh, which I like the last four, the action tracking and reporting and education um, of clinicians. This is just a brief overview of our team here at Rochester. Again, anyone's welcome to contact us if there's any questions at any time. But how did I get involved in the COVID pandemic? Besides just being an infectious disease physician, um, our antimicrobial stewardship, and this has been well described across our country, is actually, they're well equipped uh, to help with the COVID pandemic. Um, and this was a, a great diagram put out um, by Priya Nori on, down at Downstate. Um, and it really shows that antimicrobial stewardship programs, really we, we collaborate with infection prevention, we're involved in diagnostics with the laboratory, and we're involved with treatment uh, decision-making already. So really we hit all three areas where COVID-19 um, um, prevention is really needed. Um, and I'm gonna to focus today mostly on the treatment because a lot of what we do day to day with our team is coming up with treatment guidelines, managing uh, and assisting with drug shortages, which obviously I think we're all experiencing with COVID-19. 
Um, we work with our local IRBs to help with emergency use agents and the paperwork associated with that. And then we monitor this and, and hopefully improve uh, compliance um, and continually improve our, our patient care. This is another one of my favorite uh, diagrams. So to set the stage for kind of the therapeutics uh, for COVID, kind of what we, what we know about the disease. I'm not gonna get in too much of the pathophysiology of it, um, but what we really think is early on, there's this big viral response that really causes, again, this is where people get a lot of their constitutional symptoms, their fever, their dry cough, you get some sinus problems. Um, and this is where we usually see people in the outpatient world. Um, a lot of people kind of hit this phase and they really don't progress, thankfully, with this disease. Um, but there is a subset of people that uh, progress um, to this pulmonary phase where we start getting more shortness of breath, um, people get hypoxic, and this is where the overlap of the virus is starting to wane um, in terms of its effect on the body. And really the host um, inflammatory response starts to really pick up. Um, and then we get into this stage uh, called hyperinflation, uh, inflammation, sorry, um, where we really see, unfortunately, our patients progress to the hospital. The, a lot of them are admitted to the intensive care unit. Um, a lot of them have acute respiratory distress syndrome, shock, and cardiac failure. Um, and really on with the treatments, we, we really didn't know where to place many of these. We had some clues uh, based on how these different drugs um, act. Um, and I think a lot of it obviously was a little bit of a guessing game. Um, and I'll show a modified version of this, um, of this diagram later on to kind of show where our thinking is currently. But this is a nice framework to kind of describe uh, the different therapeutics. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by talking about some of the early therapeutics that really came out in the spring of 2020. Um, and a lot of these you'll see that we really don't use anymore. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of the data uh, behind each of these agents and kind of why we don't use them anymore. Obviously, I think the most controversial um, early on was chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. Um, so as, as an overview, this was an FDA approved drug for lupus, rheumatoid arthritis and malaria. Um, and really it was Chinese researchers um, early on in the pandemic that found that this drug really uh, inhibits viral replication um, and actually gets good penetration of lung tissues, which people thought, hey, this may be a, a good drug. Um, it's reasonably safe um, that we can use. Um, and there was an early study by Gao um, that looked at 100 patients in China and they used chloroquine and they said this was a superior drug uh, compared to using uh, nothing at all. They said it decreased the exacerbation of pneumonia. There was improved uh, lung findings on imaging. Um, they promoted uh, a virus to negative conversion on, um, on lab testing and it really shortened the disease course. Um, this was followed by a series of other studies here I listed um, that showed similar effects. Um, probably the most um, influential early study was by Didier Raoult, who, uh, for people who know, is a very uh, famous French virologist. Um, and he looked at very few patients, but 36 patients. Um, and what he did is look at 16 controls, so people who just got standard of care, 14 patients who got hydroxychloroquine, and six who got a combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And early on, obviously, this shows kind of the trouble with uh, conducting research effectively in a pandemic, they didn't look at anything clinically. They were just looking at laboratory-based testing. And what they found is that if you look here at the controls, the black line, um, through the first six days, the percentage of patients that converted to negative uh, PCR testing um, really was only about uh, one to two out of the controls. If you look at the next blue line here, this is hydroxychloroquine, which showed improvement to almost half of the patients by day six, converting to negative. Um, but the most astonishing thing and what they really um, uh, glommed onto was that if you use this combination with uh, azithromycin, all six patients uh, had negative conversion by day five. Now, what they said early on was this showed synergistic effect and these two drugs should be the standard of care for all uh, COVID-19 patients. Um, this was uh, accepted pretty much worldwide. Didier Raoult was, like I said, a very famous French virologist. Um, a lot of what he says is taken um, uh, as gold and, and everyone said, okay, we must use this. But if you dig down in the data, it really wasn't, um, wasn't that conclusive. So I, I kind of separate this out. You can see the first 16 controls, um, the next patients that got hydroxychloroquine and the last six who got um, the combination. Um, and what you'll notice is that a lot of these patients, you can see here, here's the, the numbers here represent um, um, PCR cycle time. So the higher the cycle time, the less virus there is. Usually goes up to about 40 or 50. Uh, the lower the number, the more virus they have. You can see here that all these groups, there is a 
big variety in data. Some just have positive, some have no data, some have numbers um, across all these groups. And then at the very end with day six, some have no data, some have positive. So he counted these um, as, as not being conclusive, even though there's no data. Um, this paper was ultimately actually retracted um, from the medical journal um, after weeks of, of being out there. And I unfortunately caused a lot of problems early on in the pandemic. Since then, um, there have been multiple studies coming out. Um, and these are two, I picked two from the New England Journal of Medicine um, that really showed that hydroxychloroquine does not work uh, in COVID-19. One was a large observational study um, in New York City that looked at a lot more patients, um, almost 1,400, and they looked at a composite endpoint of intubation or death, and there was no significant association with hydroxychloroquine uh, use and decrease in intubation or death. Uh, you can see the results here. Um, and then we had our, one of our first randomized uh, trials for post-exposure prophylaxis. So this was actually a randomized double-blind placebo control trial in Canada and the U.S., and they looked at high risk exposure. So these are people who didn't necessarily have disease, but were around someone early on when masking wasn't really uh, being used widespread. And they, what they found is that hydroxychloroquine really did not help uh, with the development of new disease. You can see here is pretty much the same whether you got hydroxychloroquine or placebo. Um, and more significantly we found is that hydroxychloroquine was associated with significantly more side effects, 40% versus obviously about 17 with the placebo group. Um, so since then, hydroxychloroquine has really gone out of use, and I think most of you guys have seen it. We have really haven't used this drug since maybe May of, of the earlier this year. Um, the next drug that got a lot of attention was lopinavir ritonavir, or called Kaletra. And this is actually uh, an old HIV drug uh, that we used to use in the 90s um, and later. Um, it's a boosted protease inhibitor. Um, and again, another study early out of China uh, that looked at about 200 patients um, comparing uh, lopinavir ritonavir for 14 days versus standard of care. Um, and they were looking time to clinical improvement or live discharge. And you can see here um, on this uh, graph right here that really these two lines didn't separate that much over the full 28 days. And it was not statistically dif uh, different or clinically different in time to improvement. Um, there was also, you can see here, a 22% mortality um, in these groups, uh, which obviously wasn't good, but I think also points to the fact that um, unfortunately our understanding of the disease wasn't great early on. Um, the next drug that, again, got widely in favor was tocilizumab. Um, and this is an immune modulatory agent also used for RA, um, ju juvenile RA, giant cell RAs, and cytokine storm. Um, and this binds to soluble and membrane brown uh, IL-6. Uh, I mean, it really inhibits the pro-inflammatory effects. Um, there was many thoughts early on that for severe disease, people who are uh, in the ICU, if you remember my graph early on with the inflammatory phase, that this drug could really have a significant benefit. Um, and there was maybe some early studies anecdotally that showed that, but really since then, um, there's been very few data that showed that tocilizumab um, is that beneficial. Um, again, here is a summary of a bunch of different uh, trials that were done. Most of them were retrospective. Um, some were randomized more recently and prospective. Um, and what each of these studies looked at um, was mortality at 28 or 30 days. Um, and really none of these studies uh, showed any um, survival benefit with tocilizumab. And a recent a randomized trial from Mass Massachusetts General revealed no uh, difference in prevention of intubation or death as well. Um, so tocilizumab has kind of, uh, again, largely gone out of favor. Um, and I mentioned all these drugs because we used all these at Strong very early on. Um, again, we didn't really know how to treat this disease. Um, and we, we want to do everything we can. So we were giving uh, our patients hydroxychloroquine. We were giving our patients tozolizumab. But as obviously new data comes out, we learned a lot more and, and changed our treatment guidelines. Um, and really in the summer is when we started to see some agents start to have some effects. So I'm going to spend most of my time talking about remdesivir, uh, dexamethasone. I'll briefly touch base on covalescent plasma, uh, which is probably the one newer agent that's kind of fallen out of favor. Um, and then more recently, baricitinib, uh, which should be being, uh, data should be being released hopefully tomorrow. So remdesivir, and I think this is the one probably people are most interested or heard the most about. Um, so this was a drug that was actually initially uh, developed by Gilead for Ebola and Marburg virus uh, when we had our big Ebola outbreaks happening in Africa a couple of years ago. Um, it interferes with the RNA polymerase um, and it has many acti much activity against multiple single-stranded RNA viruses, um, such as MERS, SARS, um, RSV, Nipah, and Lhasa. Um, it's been currently studied in a lot of these um, uh, viral infections. 
And it, it really rose to prominence uh, early on in the course of the, of the COVID pandemic when a patient was treated in Washington state um, and they progressed to pneumonia. And when they got this drug, there was at the time rapid improvement in the, in the patient's symptoms um, and ultimately he was uh, discharged. Um, it is an IV medicine. Um, so it's largely given obviously only in inpatients. Um, and it's, it's actually very well tolerated. Its main side effects um, are liver uh, function test abnormalities um, that do improve rapidly with discontinuation. So the first study that really looked at this was the NIH sponsored adaptive COVID uh, treatment trial or the ACT ACTT trials. Um, and what you'll see is there's multiple ACT trials. Um, this is ACT-1. Um, ACT-2, which I'll talk about at the very end with baricitinib, is just being published. And ACT-3 um, is just finished and ACT-4 is currently starting. Um, U of R has two site PIs, Ann Falsey and Angela Branch, who run uh, the NIH uh, trials here. Um, this study looked at um, the primary endpoint of time to clinical improvement on an eight-point ordinal scale. And I'll show this uh, scale in a, in a little one more slide. They looked, it's pretty inclusive. It basically included anyone who was an adult greater than 18 who was COVID positive. Um, they excluded patients who already had baseline LFT abnormalities, um, five times the upper limit of normal, those with uh, creatinine dysfunction or kidney dysfunction, and those are pregnant. Um, that being said, um, and this is currently still true, the FDA does have an emergency use program for pediatric patients and pregnant women uh, for its use. Um, this is the, the study of the patient characteristics, and I, I show this just to show the ordinal scale. So one, two, and three are basically all outpatient, and it has to do with basically how you're functioning in terms of your, your daily activity. So I didn't list those here, but four, five, six, and seven are the most important. So four is, means you're hospitalized, but you're not requiring oxygen. Um, five is you're hospitalized requiring supplemental oxygen. Six is you're hospitalized requiring non-invasive ventilation, um, such as BiPAP or CPAP, or re receiving high flow uh, nasal cannula. And then seven is basically you're hospitalized, often in the ICU, you're receiving mechanical ventilation or ECMO. Um, and what they did is here is you're looking for time to clinical improvement in the, in the 28 day uh, time period from either uh, a seven, six or five or four uh, down to basically three or below. And what you see here, here are the results. So again, from this one, this is the overall, all the patients being studied. And you'll see this is the uh, proportion recovered on the y-axis and days on the x-axis. And the red is the placebo, the blue is remdesivir. And so as you can see, um, anyone with uh, remdesivir, the blue being higher than the placebo and having some separation um, is a good thing. So the overall benefit um, for all patients, regardless of your oxygen status, showed a benefit of remdesivir by day 28. Um, interestingly enough, those not receiving oxygen really didn't have much of a benefit. Um, those receiving high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation, again, you can see pretty, pretty much overlap here. And those in mechanical ventilation um, or ECMO did not see much benefit. The large benefit for the overall um, patients was those receiving supplemental oxygen, where you can see the big separation in the patients. Um, and this is where you can see a, um, um, a forest plot of basically all the subgroup analysis here. Again, this study wasn't powered for all this, but you can see, just eyeballing it, you can see younger patients and those who were on just oxygen down here, uh, ordinal scale five, showed the most benefit. Obviously, if you're crossing this dotted line, um, it's really not significantly, not statistically significant. And obviously, if you're way over here, placebo is better. And just if you dive in this, and this is why I always talk, tell people to look at the supplements sometimes, because even though it's not published in the main paper, it often has uh, very important details. So if you look at the overall, again, overall patient time to recovery um, for remdesivir versus placebo, you can see almost a 30% um, increase in the overall recovery rate of patients. And that was statistically significant. And that again is largely driven by this ordinal scale five, where you can see um, almost a 45% uh, better chance of recovery. Um, again, what you're looking here is making sure these two numbers do not cross one, where you can see those on no oxygen, those who are on a little bit more invasive oxygen and those obviously in mechanical ventilation, all these numbers uh, in between the parentheses crossed one. So it was not statistically significant. People always then ask me, okay, what about mortality? And if you look at it through the first 14 days, remdesivir seemed to actually have a mortality benefit. 
Um, when you got to the end of the study period, it seemed to even out and there wasn't um, a statistically significant mortality benefit. Now you can see here as a p-value of 0.07, we try to look at below 0.05 or below. So it's trending that direction. Um, so there may be a mortality signal here. And again, this is largely driven by these patients who are um, early on in their course, again, on supplemental oxygen. Um, again, if you look at the other groups, again, did not show much of benefit. And I always point this out, this is largely due to where this drug acts. It acts on viral replication. So that's early on in the course when patients have active virus replicating is when this uh, drug probably has its most benefit. And that's probably at this group here on oxygen. So key takeaways from this study was that there was a five days uh, shorter recovery time for all patients. There was a lower progression to non-invasive mechanical ventilation for patients. There was a mortality reduction, even though it was not statistically significant for those receiving oxygen uh, but the mortality reduction was not seen in our sickest patients. Um, in contrast to this, um, a recent study uh, within the past month came out from the WHO called the Solidarity Trial. Um, and this looked specifically at mortality of four uh, repurposed drugs, what they call remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, and interferon. You obviously recognize some of these from early on um, study. This was a worldwide study, it looked at uh, 405 hospitals, 30 countries, um, almost 11,000 uh, randomized patients. And again, here, I won't go into the detail, but this is all the patients that received each, um, each active therapy. Um, and again, here, similar plots we see, and I, I just pulled out the remdesivir one. And again, you'll see this is mortality, so it's a little bit different, but you can see basically the mortality um, overlapped here. So this was not, I don't think, too surprising. Um, again, the, the ACT trial did not show a significant mortality difference. Um, but it showed a time to recovery benefit, which again has a lot of, a lot of meaning uh, to our hospitalized patients if you get them out or sooner or not. Again, this does not show a necessarily a mortality difference, um, which is unfortunate, but again, I don't think it was too surprising to a lot of us. Um, this was a combination they did uh, for all the trials um, looking at mortality. As you can see here the solidarity trial that looked at the different um, oxygen status patients the ACT trial, which I uh, talked about. And then there was a couple of studies out of China early on. And what you can see here is looking at mortality. If you look at the very bottom, um, it's close, um, but not quite. It crosses over the line and crosses one. Um, so again, what they're concluding is that there may be a trend towards a mortality difference for remdesivir, um, but it's not significant. Um, I will say there's a lot of problems with this trial. Um, so I always take this data for a grain of salt. Um, it was done across the globe, which I give the WHO a lot of credit for, um, but there was no placebo, there's no blinding, there's no data monitoring. We really don't know how each country confirmed their diagnosis. We don't know about the timing of symptoms before each treatment was given. Each country obviously had different supportive care. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these countries were in third world uh, nations and they don't have the IC support that a lot of other countries have. Um, and we don't know, again, a lot of the patients had to stay in the hospital for their 10-day course of remdesivir, regardless if they got better. Um, that was the one difference for the NIH trial that uh, patients who got better could be discharged even if they didn't finish their drug. Um, so a lot of problems been there, but I think the overall benefit of remdesivir is there early on, we think, and we are currently giving it uh, to our hospitalized patients. So I'm gonna move next um, to talk about dexamethasone. Um, so again, I think most people know dexamethasone, it's a corticosteroid, um, first made in 1957, um, and it's listed as one of the WHO's essential medicines. Um, in 2017, which is the most recent data, it was the 321st most prescribed medication in the US with over 1 million uh, doses, uh, our treatment courses given. Um, prior to 2020, obviously, this is mainly used to treat inflammatory conditions, anaphylaxis, autoimmune conditions. Um, but an initial study out of Spain actually showed that methylprednisolone had a beneficial effect for severe patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. Um, and it decreased the composite score of ICU admission, non-invasive mechanical ventilation, or uh, death. Um, and you can see here the reference down below. This led to probably one of the most significant uh, and probably so far influential studies um, in COVID treatments called the Recovery Trial, uh, which studied uh, hospitalized patients at 176 sites in the UK. Um, these patients were randomized to receive either um, oral or IV dexamethasone for up to 10 days versus placebo. Um, and their primary outcome was mortality uh, at 28 days. They did look at some secondary outcomes such as time to discharge, need for mechanical ventilation, duration of mechanical ventilation, and a couple other um, um, secondary outcomes. 
Um, again, this is just showing the patient uh, population here, um, pretty equal. And again, towards um, dexamethasone versus usual care, and then looking at the respiratory support. And they separated into no oxygen, oxygen versus uh, mechanical ventilation. And so again, some of the similar uh, plots we've seen before, and I will again mention this is a mortality plot. So again, um, a little bit different in time to recovery. So what we want to see here is the usual care is the black line, dexamethasone is the red line. And again, what we want to see is obviously the, the dexamethasone red line to be lower um, due to mortality. Um, and you can look at all participants, there was a difference. Um, and different than remdesivir, this one showed the most benefit in those requiring uh, invasive mechanical ventilation um, or oxygen. If you did not receive oxygen, it actually flipped that dexamethasone may have had a higher mortality. And you can see here another forest plot here looking again, don't wanna see it cross one. So if you were on mechanical ventilation or receiving any type of oxygen, um, there was an overall benefit in mortality um, to dexamethasone. So this was the one of the first groundbreaking studies that showed a mortality benefit for a drug um, in COVID-19 pneumonia. The one thing I'm gonna point out is, look, this is an early study. The mortality for the usual care group was almost up to 25% in all patients. That is pretty staggering. Um, I can say if we had a 25% mortality in our patients with COVID-19 who got um, admitted in the hospital, um, it, it would not be good. We never quite reached obviously that high uh, in upstate New York, um, but this was early on in the disease, lots of patients. Um, but again, that's one of the big um, limitations of the study is that mortality was super high. And again, in those in mechanical ventilation, almost 40% in the usual care group died, uh, which we have not seen. So um, one argument is that it was not hard to see mortality um, difference when you start with mortality that high. Um, because of the study, more trials came out and I'll show a summary a bunch, but this was the next one that I thought I would show, um, mainly because uh, the first group used dexamethasone at a six milligram daily dose. Um, this group out of Brazil used a slightly different um, uh, dosing. Um, there was a recent study in the spring looking at dexamethasone and steroid use in ARDS without COVID that showed larger doses followed by a taper uh, was more beneficial. So they took this data and gave that higher dose. They gave 20 milligrams daily for five days, followed by 10 milligrams for five days um, or until they were discharged and looked at these patients. And they looked at an outcome of days alive or ventilator free, so not mortality again. And this was codenamed the CODEX trial. And what you can see here um, is that in times of days alive or ventilator free, those who received dexamethasone um, had a higher days alive or ventilator free um, compared to um, standard of care, um, statistically significant and probably clinically significant. Um, again, what's interesting is here, look at the mortality though. Um, there was no mortality difference, but pretty high mortality in each group um, in almost half the patients. Um, again, this was a study done out of Brazil, um, and again, varying sites across Brazil that may not have had the, the usual standard of care that, that we see here in the United States or in England, um, but pretty high. So here is a summary of all the trials. Since steroids have probably gotten the, the most press and, and shown the most benefit, um, they, the JAMA article um, I present here from, I think it was September, showed a summary of all these. Um, and again, what you'll see is a lot of these studies looked at different types of steroids, dexamethasone, hydrocortisone, methylprednisolone, and at varying their mortality um, or ventilator free, but most were mortality. And if you look at these, all still pretty small studies. Um, again, the biggest one was recovery, um, which you can see here, this is the one out of the UK that I talked about. All the rest of these pretty much had low numbers of patients. Um, the other important thing is, pretty much hardly any one of these studies also got remdesivir um, or for any other treatment besides azithromycin and a few early on got uh, hydroxychloroquine. Um, so really a few confounders with other drugs. Um, and again, similar diagrams we're used to seeing, most um, show favor um, in steroids here. So this is the favor steroids if you're left of this uh, dotted line. Um, and then if you break it up um, in different subgroups, age, sex, um, again, have the highest effect. Um, so, you know, the take home full point for dexamethasone is the only drug so far to show mortality benefit. But a lot of these studies, especially the two I showed, had high baseline mortalities. Um, and we may, we may be seeing um, an exaggerated effect from this. Um, that being said, um, remdesivir and steroids are still part of our mainstay of treatment for all our hospitalized patients um, currently. 
I mentioned I would talk about coblescent plasma briefly. Um, again, there was a lot of interest in this as well. Um, again, taking um, plasma from uh, donors who recover from it, assuming they have antibodies there, and then infusing it into patients who have COVID. Um, going um, a lot of controversial data, but really the bottom line is there really isn't much of a benefit in a large review of these of clinical trials that have ongoing, um, a fair large number of patients. And we're seeing actually a fair amount of side effects. I think people worry about blood products causing side effects right away. But we're actually seeing that most of these side effects from plasma are happening um, actually more than just the infusion time. So only 146 serious adverse events happen within the four hours versus almost 11, over 1,100 within seven days. Uh, be causing patients to have more serious adverse events um, later on the, uh, after receiving this treatment. Um, again, we are not using this uh, treatment widely um, at Strong currently. The last drug I'm going to talk about is baricitinib. Um, and I think we'll see um, data published about this um, tomorrow in the New England Journal. But baricitinib is uh, as a what's called a Janice kinase inhibitor. Um, and I show some uh, information here. This was actually initially improved uh, approved by the FDA for our rheumatoid arthritis um, um, who had failed other treatments. Um, again, you can see here that baricitinib acts on mostly the JAK1 and JAK2, a little bit of JAK3. Um, and really this is um, a big immune modulatory agent. You can see here has multiple different effects, these, these JAK enzymes um, involved in lymphocyte proliferation, T cell differentiation, uh, myelopoiesis, um, and it also has some effects on the innate uh, viral defense. And this has to do with multiple different inflammatory cytokines binding to receptors um, and causing these downstream effects. Um, in November of this year, um, the FDA actually approved emergency use of baricitinib in combination with uh, remdesivir uh, for those receiving supplemental oxygen invasive mechanical inflammation or ECMO. Um, and this was largely due to the ACT2 data, uh, which I'll mention in a brief moment. Um, but there's been actually currently nine studies looking at baricitinib across the globe. Um, it was first actually used way back in March of this year in Italy. Um, and this was used actually in combination with the pinavir ritonavir. Um, again, similar concept, um, using it with an antiviral. Uh, but they only looked at uh, 12 patients in each group. Um, but it showed that baricitinib um, improved patients to discharge within two weeks um, in the baricitinib arm versus none in the control arm. So there was early hints that baricitinib may, back in March of 2020, show some benefit. And that led to the NIH um, looking at um, baricitinib plus remdesivir versus remdesivir alone. And again, this was from the press release, and we should have the final data uh, published tomorrow. Um, but it was 1,000 patients, um, about 500 in each, a little over 500 in each arm. Um, and they, again, looked at the time to recovery as their primary endpoint. Um, but then they also looked at hospital discharge, or they defined this as hospital discharge, or those if they're currently still hospitalized, but they didn't require supplemental oxygen or ongoing medical care. Um, and what they found is that in the overall group, the median time to recovery was seven days in the combination arm versus eight days in the remdesivir alone. Um, there was a lower odds of death or intubation by day 29, and there was a higher odds of clinical improvement by day 15. There are some safety concerns with this, um, a little bit more than remdesivir. We have to monitor their CBC with diff and CMP just as remdesivir but there seems to be a, a higher risk of lymphopenia. If you remember how this drug works, it affects kind of T cell differentiation um, and myelopoiesis. So again, not surprising you can get lymphopenia and neutropenia from it. It can cause some liver enzyme abnormalities as well. Um, the biggest risk that I think most of us get nervous about, but we're not really sure it's gonna be um, a real problem is the risk of uh, thrombosis um, and opportunistic infections. Um, obviously COVID um, has an increased uh, thrombotic risk we're seeing. So you add a drug that increases that even more, it makes us feel a little worried. It's also a, a concern with this drug uh, just due to its ability to decrease um, uh, the immune system's ability to fight infections. These were though all studied in RA, so long-term users um, in this drug. Um, right now we're only using this drug uh, for 14 days total. Um, so again, very a lot different time use in this drug. Um, I pulled this data. This is actually uh, updated from 12.6, which I put here. 
Um, we started using this drug about two weeks ago and we decided to preferentially use this in our patients with high flow nasal cannula. Um, we figured this is the group that we wanna try to prevent from progressing to intubation um, based on other data that we've seen. And, and again, we've used it in a very select amount of patients. Only about 27 patients now have been placed on it. And this was from through the weekend. Um, three patients, additional patients were approved but never received it either due to refusal or unfortunately they got intubated before starting the drug. We've actually had six live discharges in these two weeks since uh, starting this drug. Only one death, unfortunately, in one of our patients we started this work with, and very few side effects. Um, we had two serious adverse events that we had to stop the drug. One was due to a low lymphocyte count, but actually recovered the very next day. Um, we don't really think it was due to the drug. And one with acute kidney injury that um, unfortunately was multifactorial. They were already um, heading towards uh, acute renal failure and it just further progressed, so we felt um, that we needed to stop the drug um, as a possible contributing factor. Um, but we're actually seeing this drug has, has been fairly, fairly safe in this short time we've been using it. Um, so because of all that, we've actually started adding this to our, our treatment algorithm, which I'll show um, on, the, on the last slide. So again, I, I bring you guys back to this, this slide on therapeutics. Again, I think our early thinking was, was, was right in that there's different stages of this disease from the viral response to the inflammatory response. Um, ultimately to this hyperinflation. And again, I'm trying to figure out where these different drugs fit into the equation um, was a little bit of an unknown and a guesswork early on. What I think is better now is what we see is that obviously you have this viral um, response, which maybe as an outpatient, maybe early on in your mission, or really in compare remdesivir almost to like Tamiflu with flu, is that it helps maybe shorten the duration. Yes, maybe it helps you feel a little bit better sooner, but it's not gonna get rid of flu any sooner. Um, it's not gonna get rid of COVID any sooner for the remdesivir. Um, so that's the most important thing to remember about this. Um, then when you head into this pulmonary phase where you start to gain a little overlap, this is where the antivirals, the corticosteroids, maybe the plasma, again, we don't really think it's, that's gonna really pan out, but maybe that's where that fits in um, is most important. And then as you progress to this inflammatory phase, this is really where our corticosteroids, maybe our JAK inhibitors, um, the IL-6 inhibitors with tocilizumab, maybe this will help. Um, so really blending for our inpatients, trying to prevent this interface as best we can with our antivirals, our corticosteroids. And then ultimately, if they're kind of on this cusp, do we give them a JAK inhibitor such as baricitinib to prevent that further progression is kind of our, our line of thinking. Um, this is our current uh, COVID treatment guideline. I think this is, I've never been on a guideline that's been revised so much as this one. I feel like we go through this every week um, and change something to it. Um, but pretty much all our patients who are, um, again, everyone's considered severe if you're hospitalized, but we kind of made it moder mild, moderate, and severe to help our providers look at this better. Pretty much everyone's getting remdesivir. If you're requiring oxygen, pretty much everyone's getting dexamethasone. And then we're considering baricitinib in a certain subset of population um, until we get a, a little bit more data. Uh, we also have multiple clinical trials that are ongoing as well that we're trying to prioritize our patients for um, over these treatments if possible. So lastly, what does the future hold? And I think, again, this is the, the next big buzz, which we're all hearing about, is really the vaccines. And I'm not going to touch too much into this because I think there's going to be a lot more that could go into this uh, that could spend in an hour. Um, but I, I just want like to point out, this is a monumental task and I, it's unbelievable this is actually being accomplished um, at the, the time frame we're doing. I looked at a couple, again, you look at polio. Um, again, this is unfair because this was first discovered back in the 1800s, um, but it took 60 years to develop a vaccine. Ebola, SARS, MERS, um, again, Ebola is the only one of those that we actually have a vaccine and it took 15 years. SARS and MERS, thankfully, haven't become really true pandemics um, since their initial introduction, so we haven't needed a vaccine. But with COVID, we're trying to get a vaccine within 12 months, um, which is, again, truly astonishing. It's a, it's, a, it's a monumental effort that I think everyone should be proud of here. And it looks like we're going to have our first vaccine roll out in the next couple of weeks, um, which is, is truly exciting. Um, so... I'll end by saying, you know, conducting studies during a pandemic is difficult, whether it's related to the disease or other diseases you're trying to study previously, which I think Danielle will talk about. It's not easy. Um, be wary of preprint studies before they officially come out um, and peer reviewed. I think we've seen that with hydroxychloroquine um, and a little bit with Kalitra, which I mentioned that, you know, we all saw these preprints, um, but no one knew the true data. So be wary. That's changing a little bit. We're not seeing too much of that more recently, but be wary. 
there really is no miracle drug for COVID. A lot of this, this is the best supportive care you can give a patient. Um, remdesivir and dexamethasone seem to be the most beneficial with maybe the additional baricitinib in certain patients. Um, and this, these three drugs right now are kind of what we're, what we're looking into offering most of our patients or, uh, that are hospitalized. Um, but basically, basic public health measures such as hand washing, social distancing, and masking really do remain the best uh, treatment and prevention. Um, so I'll end um, there. And I know if there's questions, I can always answer them now or at the end before I turn it over to Daniela. So, wow, that was a ton of information. <laughs> um, and thank you so much for all the, uh, all the graphs. It made it so much easier to understand. Um, there may be some questions, please type them into the chat. Um, but I had a question for you. Wondering, did, when, when these tests were, um, and you know, I'm, I'm a novice, so I, I don't even really know how to word the question that I want to ask, but yeah. when they were looking at patients and, um, and the effects that certain drugs had on their, uh, on their conditions, did they look at all into the vitamin regimen that they were already on? Um, do vitamins play a role in treatment at all? Yeah, that's a great, that's, and that's come up more and more. I think, you know, we always look at that. And I think people always, especially vitamin C, there's been more in the uh, um, uh, press recently about vitamin D. Um, and I think, you know, we've always looked into these um, and, and there's always been some anecdotal evidence that they may offer some benefit, but it's, they're never been groundbreaking or anything truly influential. I think, you know, obviously if someone's vitamin D deficient or, or not having enough vitamin C, it sets them back a little bit, but supplementing them has never seen um, a dramatic improvement in patient symptoms or prevention. Um, so I think it plays a little bit of a role, but I don't think, again, I think most things like, like even for this, this disease, there's no, right now, no miracle <laughs> drug out there that is, you know, going to be the magic bullet. Um, so, and I, again, before I forget, I will say that uh, I mentioned this, Lisa, I will, I'll share my size as a PDF for people um, ultimately, because there is a lot of information in there that's um, a lot to digest. So I'll be, ha I'll be happy to do that um, after the presentation. That's great. Thank you. Um, I have a comment from Tammy Walston. She says, absolutely fascinating info. I hear so many people that I that don't like the changing information, but they have to realize that this is an ongoing disease. And yes, especially hearing, you know, the processes that that are in place, it's it's incredibly complex to to figure out what to what to give the people who are suffering from this disease. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, highlighting that, I think, you know, we always talk about, you know, looking at different drugs and stuff like that. I try to remind people when we normally conduct clinical trials, this data is coming out years after the, after it's been studied. I mean, we're coming, we're trying to, you know, people are researchers are trying to publish this stuff within weeks to months. Um, right. And so you, you got to, I think we all got to expect there's going to be changing information. There's going to be some misinformation. It's just unfortunately the nature of, of, of dealing with the pandemic. We never had to deal with this before. And so we're all learning. So yeah, I think that's a great, um, a great point. And I think just bearing with other people that there are going to be some wrong, wrong choices in the beginning and, you know, probably still will be some. So, but just bearing with it and trying to keep up to date as best you can. So I don't know if I missed this or not, but I know that there is a, the study coming out today, you said results from a study coming out today. Um, but what is, you mentioned a fourth uh, study that you're just beginning, and I don't know if I missed it, but what is, what is that study involved? Yeah, so I mentioned, so it's the different ACT studies, AC, ACTT. So the ACT1 was just the remdesivir. The ACT2, which is going to be published, hopefully, I think it's actually tomorrow in New England, it's the um, baricitinib data with remdesivir. Um, ACT3 just finished, and that was looking at uh, remdesivir and interferon, which I don't think will have um, much influence on any treatment. The, the current one that's going to be starting, or it started in some sites, it's going to be starting up in Rochester soon, is looking at um, remdesivir plus baricitinib versus remdesivir plus dexamethasone. The, the main concern is that people get worried about using three different drugs, remdesivir, baricitinib, and steroids, which could impact a patient's immune system pretty dramatically. Um, 
And so if there's an option for one or the other in certain patient populations where we're not hitting the patient's immune system too hard, um, that's what this study is going to be looking at. Um, I okay. think it's going to be tough to recruit patients initially to say, hey, you may not get steroids when it's the only drug that's shown a mortality benefit, but um, it's, it's going to be an interesting study to see if they, if they can get it going um, in this day. <laughs> um, well, we did have another question yeah, from uh, Lorraine here. She said, early on, there were warnings not to use steroids or everyday anti-inflammatory medications when you're positive with COVID. Many of my clients are on these daily. Is this still a concern when positive with COVID? So I, I think that was initially, I think, and I think most of us have lived long enough, I can even say this, that we've seen steroids go in and out of favor so many times that people don't know what to do with it. And I think that's still relatively the case. You know, in terms of anti-inflammatory medicines, I would say keep, if they've been on it, keep patients on it. Um, steroids for, I, I, the one thing I caveat people is outpatients, um, if you're not receiving oxygen, um, so if you're just an outpatient, not hospitalized, steroids are really are no benefit. If they're on it for other reasons, I think it's, it's safe to keep them on it. But I, I tell, especially our primary care doctors is if you have a COVID positive patient coming to your clinic and you're not going to send them to the hospital, um, don't put them on steroids. Cause I don't think it's going to be beneficial. It may actually be more harmful. Um, gotcha. And so I think, you know, it's, it's a double edge. So I think steroids, I think we all talk about, should you use steroids for flu? Should you use it for other viruses? And there's so much data conflicting. And I think this will be another one that ultimately will show that, but I think, you know, for hospitalized patients, we're monitoring them pretty closely. Um, so I think giving right. them the steroids, the benefits outweigh the risks in that regard. Okay. Gotcha. Um, she said, thank you. I will share the information <laughs> with the parents to relieve their concern. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, are there any other questions from our audience? And you can go ahead, you can actually enter them anytime you want, um, but I will go ahead with Daniela so that she has time to, to uh, complete her presentation as well. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think we have just a about 38 minutes left, which should be enough time to really get through some of this and allow another opportunity for questions at the end. Um, I am, um, in addition to faculty at University of Rochester, also um, through a service contract, we staff the Monroe County Health Department STD clinic. So I'll be sharing um, information that really is a result of things we have learned and experienced and put into practice and shared with others throughout New York State. Um, a little different than um, Dave's talk. We have a lot of um, information to share and um, not a lot of data that goes with it because all that is sort of still in the process of being collected. Um, so I uh, have no disclosures and um, here are some objectives for today, which is really just to review some local epi data with regard to the um, infections we'll be discussing and then um, reviewing some alternative strategies for providing services related to these during the pandemic, and then also discussing some current CDC and um, New York State AIDS Institute guidance um, related to these. So just as a quick overview, and this slide is provided by the Department of Health for the state, showing what we're seeing, which is an across the board increase in um, STI cases. Um, just note that these are not rates here. Um, and you know, in terms of what we're looking at in Western New York, um, it is as it often is um, related to gonorrhea and chlamydia, but across the state, we are seeing um, a continued rise in congenital syphilis as well. And here um, again is a little bit of a more specific diagram in terms of the geography of uh, case locations of congenital syphilis. And you can see up here in Western New York, we have Monroe County and Erie County um, with cases reported. Uh, so again, from New York State, 54% of um, STIs are diagnosed among um, young people under the age of 26. 93% um, of primary and secondary syphilis are diagnosed among men. And 84% of these um, male diagnoses are among men who have sex with men. Um, pregnant persons can transmit STIs to their infants during pregnancy, which leads to adverse um, health outcomes for the infant, of course. And this is a primary concern related to syphilis. And uh, we do see that um, 
non-Hispanic Black individuals, Hispanic individuals, and Native American individuals uh, continue to be disproportionately impacted by STIs um, as well as HIV. And this is just, uh, again, demonstrating the disproportionate impacts on these um, communities with regard to STIs, and it's not just one, but several. Um, and here, uh, this is from uh, recent uh, New York State and the Epidemic Summit, which happened last week. And this is some of the New York State data, so showing that, you know, we, um, they had a uh, plan for ETE 2020. The goal here is um, in the purple dot, and you can see the target is the yellow line here, and where we actually are in terms of the 2019 data currently available is um, not quite there, but, but actually doing pretty well and, and close. Um, of course, the sort of disruptions of care that have happened during the pandemic have really had a significant impact on the progress of the and the epidemic uh, campaign and efforts. Here, uh, demonstrating that um, persons of trans experience um, re remain a population, um, particularly uh, trans women who are again disproportionately impacted by um, HIV. And here again, you see newly diagnosed um, HIV infections among persons with an injection drug use history. Here we're making, there's, there's a little bit more of a difference between um, the target and, and where we actually are. And so still more work to do in this um, population. Some of that has to do with um, the uh, lower uptake of PrEP in this population. And then um, this and you know the next slide, just stressing the impact of timely HIV testing and really encouraging routine HIV screening at all uh, points of healthcare. So we're still seeing concurrent um, diagnosis of AIDS um, above, uh, so about 15% is the goal. And in 2019, we were just, um, just above that at 19.6%. Here you can see, um, this is from the state and the epidemic dashboard, the percentage of uh, individuals who have ever been tested for HIV as uh, by Ryan White region in the state. And so for the Finger Lakes, um, you're looking at just under uh, 50%, and then a little bit lower in sort of the further out Western New York region at 43.4%. Um, so if you combine that with the data of the number of patients who have a diagnosis of AIDS um, at the time of their HIV diagnosis, suggesting um, they have been infected for uh, perhaps more than a year, um, we do need to expand our testing and screening efforts. With regard to hep C, um, you see kind of a fluctuating um, data in terms of the new diagnoses per year. And again, this is um, not, uh, these are cases, um, you see a 14% decrease in all newly diagnosed um, hep C since 2018, definitely an improvement. and. Um, Interestingly, an increase in the diagnoses of acute hep, acute hep C since um, 2018. And um, about 49% of people with newly um, diagnosed hep C were under 40, and 87% of those individuals under 40 um, had a history of injection drug use. So that appears to be the primarily, uh, primary um, community in which we're seeing um, increasing uh, rates of hep C at this point. And 60% of uh, new hep C diagnoses in women were in women of reproductive age in 2019. And um, just to note that we have no um, really FDA approved uh, treatments for pregnancy, though, though some are used um, on a case by case basis. So it's estimated that about six to 12% of pregnant individuals will, with hep C will transmit to the infant. So again, something to really um, target and prevent if possible. These are some recent health alerts that are worth noting, um, particularly because Monroe County is uh, involved in both. So on the um, left-hand side, you see an alert from October 15th of 2020 um, regarding increased number of HIV diagnoses in Monroe County. Um, <clears throat> quite, uh, so might be a little bit small to see here, but um, 
the preliminary data indicate the number of new HIV diagnoses in 2020 is expected to exceed the number of new diagnoses in recent years, and that means uh, going back to 2016. And this was as of uh, data received from September. Um, the number of new diagnoses among persons with a history of injection drug use has been elevated since 2019. And so what we're seeing in cases um, from uh, 2019 is that we're having um, a bit of a cluster or an increased um, incidence of HIV diagnoses among persons who inject drugs. In July of this year, um, an alert came out with regard to increased uh, diagnosis of gonorrhea. And again, there's no denominator here. These are just cases. But um, for Monroe County specifically, there's a 75% increase in diagnoses of gonorrhea from January to March of 2020, compared to the same time period in 2019. And just note that that time, that window is pre sort of pandemic um, limitation of healthcare services. So um, since that time in our clinic specifically, we have seen um, the same number of cases of gonorrhea as compared to the same time period in 2019, but actually we're testing less and we're seeing fewer patients. So we know that this is um, going to be a significant issue when um, volumes start to return to normal, people start seeking care and uh, we start doing more testing. Part of this change is probably also related to various um, institutions and clinics within the county um, ramping up extra genital testing. So, you know, in terms of healthcare during a pandemic with regard to communicable uh, diseases, um, what does that look like? So in-person care um, can be limited to varying degrees, which depends on your local prevalence of COVID um, and associated restrictions and policies from local governments and um, healthcare institutions. Um, part of what you will do in person depends on the severity of someone's illness or the potential, uh, potential morbidity associated with that illness. Um, so for example, something like syphilis, um, which can potentially progress to neurosyphilis or if pregnant, congenital syphilis for the infant. Um, it also relies on your, the availability of your staff, um, the availability to um, maintain an adequate supply of PPE, and of course, the sort of facilities that are involved in um, maintaining a safe environment. Alternatives to in-person care include deferral of some services. Um, so for example, if uh, someone needs an HPV vaccine, perhaps you can defer that for a few months. It's not an urgent thing. Um, you don't want them to come in just for a vaccine if they're feeling well, but if they are there for some other reason, of course, you can go ahead and vaccinate them. Um, these, uh, when you're talking about vaccines here, um, we specifically refer to vaccines related to sexual health care because that's what we do in, in our clinic. Um, telemedicine, of course, is available and there are hybrid models where you can do both telemedicine and in-person care depending on um, the population that you're seeing and the needs uh, of that particular population. Um, In-home testing for things like HIV, hepatitis C, or STIs um, could be considered and we'll talk about what that might look like. And then of course, there's also lab only visits. Um, so rather than having a patient come in and see you, get their blood drawn in your office or your clinic, um, you might see them over the uh, video or phone and um, send them to a lab or have the lab um, home care agency go to their house or a couple different options we'll talk about. Telemedicine has really been encouraged um, to limit exposure of individuals to the healthcare system while at the same time not delaying or deferring care. And it's really also been demonstrated that telemedicine, uh, particularly in the setting of HIV, can increase adherence to follow-up. And so that's something that we have seen in our um, strong infectious disease clinic. Um, and interestingly, in-home testing for HIV has um, been shown to reach additional populations that were not traditionally reached by routine HIV screening efforts, be it due to stigma, geographic isolation, or other psychosocial factors. So what does the reality look like at this point? We are in a pandemic still. Um, there are uh, continued recommendations for social distancing. We have extensive closures in place. Um, 
there's a constant flow of new information as um, somebody has already mentioned, which does create a lot of uncertainty, but also does inform a lot of our processes. Um, lots of anxiety among staff and patients and shortages of PPE, approved disinfectants and test kits for FDI, STIs that require um, swabs. So the goal of um, everything that we are all doing is to maintain a safe environment for patients and staff while continuing to provide essential health services, um, but minimizing the need for patients to leave their homes um, in high prevalence areas and minimizing patient contact with the healthcare system um, for those who are well. So this um, presents some challenges uh, for these various um, healthcare services with regard to diagnosis and treatment. Um, we are very used to doing things in person and not very used to um, or savvy at doing these things virtually. So of course, um, STI screening and treatment uh, has been based primarily on the exam and point of care testing or gram stain, wet prep. Um, so we have to figure out how to work around that. Um, we've also come to rely heavily on directly observed therapy and at this clinic, particularly being able to provide free medications that we have um, on site. And then of course, providing immunizations. Um, for HIV and hep C treatment, the lab monitoring is a bit different, um, requires uh, blood testing periodically and of course immunizations. And then for PrEP um, initiation and maintenance, the in-person component is um, similar to um, the above two in terms of having blood testing periodically, um, but also immunizations as well. So how do we do these um, in the absence of in-person care? Um, but we also are presented with some interesting opportunities um, for change and for improvement. Um, for STIs, uh, we sort of reverted to how things had been done years ago with syndromic management, um, which I'll talk about with uh, oral antibiotics and um, sort of expanded opportunities for um, expedited partner therapy or EPT. Really telemedicine has um, started to take off for HIV, but also for hep C and PrEP and PEP. Um, for PrEP specifically, you can do things like extended interval visits and um, you might consider using something like doxycycline for bacterial STI prophylaxis in MSM who are high risk um, and on PrEP. Additionally, um, there's these sort of new and innovative ways to do in-home um, testing or test collection for all of these different reportable infections. We reach new populations. Uh, pharmacies are now doing home delivery of medications. Um, you can get sometimes larger supp supplies like 90 days rather than 30 days. And of course, um, there's, partner, there's options to partner with local um, or regional um, healthcare organizations that might be able to complement um, services. So I have a question for you, Danielle. Yeah. Um, based on a, a discussion that we had in a previous webinar um, about telehealth, we talked about the fact that there were decreased regulations or decreased requirements concerning you know, telehealth and what was allowed and not allowed. Are you finding that in your area as well that your restrictions have been lifted in tele telehealth because of um, you know COVID nineteen and and the amount of telehealth that is required to continue the services. Yep. So I actually have a link um, that's towards the end of the presentation um, through the uh, HHS website that um, provides the specific um, expansion or or lower restrictions um, in for um, platforms that are used to conduct telehealth and communication with patients, particularly video. Um, you do have to be conscious when providing telehealth services for um, things like sexually transmitted infections um, and, and HIV with regard to patient privacy. And so you do want to make sure that that is um, paramount in terms of planning what form telehealth you're using. And in our clinic, we use only audio, um, telephone only. We do not use video. Um, uh, and that's particularly for the um, STI visits. Um, what else? Uh, so there's state level, and I have a link for that as well, um, 
policies and recommendations for use of telehealth. And then there's federal level um, in terms of Medicare and, and billing and so forth. So I have uh, some information towards the end in the PDF document with the slides. Um, if you're interested, you can actually click directly and the hyperlink will take you to those websites for more information. Oh, wonderful, Great thank question. you. Um, if you are, if you have a clinic and you're trying to figure out how to safely see patients, um, part of the process is trying to find a way to screen patients before they come to your clinic door. So we um, and many others throughout the country have started doing a phone triage uh, algorithm to try to um, contact patients or have them contact us so we can figure out whether they can be managed over the phone or whether they need to come in in person. Um, your triage should include some sort of symptom and exposure screen for COVID as well as the chief complaint or the presenting illness. Um, you should conduct the screening um, obviously prior to arrival and entry if possible. Um, and you designate some priority visit criteria. And that's particularly important for those who are providing public health services because um, each county has sort of their um, priority visit criteria, which usually is similar to the line with the state. Um, and then you develop a plan for um, those who have preventive services deferred. So um, as an example for priority visits, our clinic had chosen um, those who are pregnant, um, those who have a diagnosis with syphilis or a syphilis contact, um, HIV contacts, sexual assault, sexually transmitted um, infection symptoms that don't fit a predetermined um, syndrome in the CDC algorithm for syndromic management. Um, and th those would usually be, um, the predetermined syndromes are things like urethritis, um, vaginitis, et cetera. So it, the next step is really um, trying to communicate the change in the process to the community that you're serving, which can certainly be a challenge um, when not everyone has access to um, cable, to internet and things like that. Um, it does sort of require a change in the culture as well. We're primarily a walk-in clinic, but also do some appointments. And so um, you try to preserve uh, services as much as you can, but there are things that, that do have to change and some things that have to be on hold or, or eliminated for some amount of time during peak prevalence. Um, and for those who have a positive COVID screen, so maybe they traveled back from Florida two days ago, or they had an exposure within their household, or maybe they have some symptoms um, like a headache or a loss of taste or smell, um, try to manage them by phone whenever possible. And if they do have to be seen, you wanna take the, the necessary precautions um, in terms of PPE and keeping them um, with minimal contact with other people, um, uh, for example, in the waiting room and, and staff as well. And then of course you want to develop follow-up plans for those who are treated with alternative regimens to the usual standard of care. And, um, consider, as I said, a variety of telemedicine visit types, depending on what type of care you're providing. This is a, sort of what the clinical encounter would look like, and, and I won't go into detail, but um, there's a link here where you can click to, that will take you to the document um, that has that. And um, we created this to just sort of serve as a guide to um, a general telemedicine visit and the steps that would be involved. Um, so the, the key benefits, again, are really allowing for um, maintenance or social distancing, keeping patients at home, um, by continuing to communicate and reach out to patients, this does help with um, coping of social isolation, um, it improves individuals' access to care, and it's really ideal for um, things that don't require a physical exam. Um, particularly, you know, um, adherence, counseling, and, and things like that. So um, follow-up follow HIV visits or hepatitis C treatment does lend itself pretty well to that. Um, the limitations are, are certainly that communication can be less effective. Um, you, it, it does require the patient to have access to a phone uh, and internet, and of course, a safe and private space. Um, you don't have a physical exam unless you are doing a video assessment of the patient um, where you can do some very basic sort of visual assessment. And then um, 
most diagnostic and screening tests can't be done at home, but I'll show you some options that, that are uh, perhaps a, an adequate substitute. And um, treatment is limited to oral medications if they're not coming into clinic. And this is particularly important for STIs as we worry about emerging antibiotic resistance for gonorrhea. Um, and we're sort of right now often treating people with oral medications if we can't get them into clinic for intramuscular ceftriaxone. So again, some essential services are those with STI symptoms, people who are referred from the health department um, for treatment, those searching for um, PrEP or PEP, sexual assault, pregnant individuals, um, confirmed or unconfirmed contacts to STIs or STI syndromes. And um, we have, as a clinic have decided not to defer anyone who is specifically seeking HIV testing. Um, at the height of the pandemic, we did uh, defer screening. Um, so routine screening for asymptomatic individuals for, for STIs and also those who were seeking vaccine only visits. So back to the process, um, you're also gonna need to designate staff um, for teleworking when your clinical space is limited. And we did have to do that here. Um, and there's a process through the university by which we can do COVID-19 screening um, for on-site staff um, done through the doctor chatbot mechanism. So you go in each morning and fill out some questions about symptoms, about travel, and um, it sort of allows you to either flow into a group that says you can go to work today if you answer no, or call employee health if you have a um, answer yes to one of those questions. Um, you, as I said, can um, look for local partners who might be able to offer complementary services if there are certain things you can't offer, and we have done that here. Um, there's a process by which um, continuous review is needed of local data and policies. Um, this, again, sort, sort of means that you're continuously changing your protocols and policies. Um, it's, a, it's quite a task, but really allows you to, to stay on top of um, the most recent data and, and really the needs of the community. Danielle, you can I break in just for a second? Absolutely. I just wondered, these the processes that you're describing, did your clinic uh, look online for some kind of a template to adopt or did you come up with all of these on your own? It's a good question. At that time it was March, so we came up with these on our own, um, but you will see that since that time and you know throughout March and April, um, clinic, public health clinics um, across the country were really um, starving for information and putting up their own protocols and sharing their protocols with others. So the NCSD website, um, which I, I may have in here, I may not, but I can, I can share it in the chat at the end. Um, so um, this is a website that had a sort of a STD command center section and uh, many different clinics from all over the country were putting their protocols in there so that others could share from the experience and benefit from those experiences. So, so we didn't have it at that time, but we sort of were able to go on and see after the fact that we were all kind of reinventing the wheel together and came up with similar um, protocols uh, with some variation kind of depending on the population you serve because a lot of those are from um, city, inner city clinics. Great, thank um, you. Yeah, the New York City Department of Health also has a protocol, but again, was quite different because of the prevalence of COVID in New York City. They were essentially right. not doing any in-person care for quite some time, so. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, just uh, one other point is that um, for clinics with on-site medications, um, Obviously, electronic prescribing is available for patients with insurance, um, but for those who, who aren't able to do that, um, patients could certainly come and pick up at the door rather than entering into the clinical space. Um, but electronic prescription to pharmacies with um, home delivery, if possible, is always a great option. Um, in terms of trying to do as much as possible over the phone, um, this is something that, that 
seems to be beneficial um, really in areas where there's high COVID prevalence because you're limiting that face-to-face -face time and that potential exposure time in the uh, very small exam room. So things uh, that you can obtain over the phone are all of these sort of from intake to you know right before you would start your exam of the patient. Um, and you can do that when the patient is at home and then they come into the clinic or you can do that while they're outside in, your, in their car. Um, you know, again, as long as they have a safe and private space. Um, and then for patients who, who don't have phones, um, you can, you know, obviously you end up doing some of this in the room, but you can try to abbreviate some of this to really the essential elements necessary to provide your care. And that might mean you provide a little bit less in comprehensive counseling, but still really trying to include all those elements, even if they're abbreviated. Um, you do want to ensure a safe clinical space for patients and staff. So that um, looks a little bit uh, different depending on your clinical setting, but um, reduction in waiting room occupancy um, is uh, definitely important. Um, enhanced cleaning protocols with appropriate disinfectants, which were quite hard to find for a while. Um, masks and hand hygiene for patients um, on entry and you know throughout their um, stay in the clinic um, and then appropriate PPE for staff, of course. So for all encounters, um, staff should be wearing um, eye protection, mask and gloves um, for our types of services. And then if, patient as a, if a patient has a positive item on their COVID screen and they do need to be seen as an in-person visit, um, you would want to also add a gown and make sure that the staff has appropriate donning and doffing training. Um, and separating the workspaces and minimizing shared workstations is also um, helpful. We have been fortunate in our setting not to have any positive um, cases am among the staff uh, related to COVID with these measures. Um, in the exam room, try uh, you know, to increase that distance between the clinician and the patient um, when possible. Again, minimizing the face-to-face -face time, um, Really important for uh, the sexual health setting is trying to have patients self-obtain their swabs, um, particularly the oropharyngeal swab. And um, we've also deferred sort of head and neck exams unless a patient is being staged for syphilis or has symptoms in this area. And um, lastly, uh, reserving pharyngeal testing or pharyngeal swabs um, for MSM who are um, at highest risk or again, for those with symptoms. And you also can sort of bypass this if it's not really going to change your treatment. Um, so what might STI care look like during COVID? These are just some examples. Um, so for example, if somebody calls ahead, they say my partner has uh, had chlamydia. Um, we can do their assessment and uh, care over the phone and send an electronic prescription. They don't come in at all. If somebody calls and they have um, urethral discharge that's perilent, um, we have uh, guidance from the CDC, which I put a link to from their Dear Colleague letter, April 2020, uh, which recommends high dose cifixime plus oral azithromycin. It's an oral regimen. It can be e-prescribed or if no insurance, they can come and pick it up at our clinic door at the end of the telephone encounter. And again, they have not entered the clinical space and hopefully um, can keep them at home if possible. Um, things that might bring a person in, abdominal pain in a female patient, you might be suspicious for PID, proctitis um, in a male patient, um, or perhaps a trans female patient, and uh, you wanna do an exam in that case. Um, we are not um, doing oral treatment for syphilis at this time, unless there are uh, certain allergies, but we're bringing patients in for syphilis treatment. So here, just this is a table from the Dear Colleague letter. So um, oral medications as a harm reduction approach, and there'll be a link to this at the end. But this sort of shows you the different STI syndromes on the left. And here, um, some recommendations for treatment. And um, they've also included in this letter, but I've just put them here for your reference, recommendations for follow-up when people are managed with these alternatives. 
For HIV and Hep C, um, the challenges are similar. You really need blood testing um, for these uh, in terms of monitoring and treatment, but um, the frequency is, is less. And so um, there's different types of sampling or tests available. FDA approved tests are by phlebotomy. Um, there's also home kits where you can collect a finger stick for a dried blood spot. Um, there's uh, and send it into a lab. Um, there are oral swabs for rapid HIV self-testing that can be done at home. And there's different types of point and care testing that are also available. Um, but again, you can continue to pre-screen these um, patients by phone and um, consider telemedicine visits with a separate lab visit or even delaying the labs for a couple of months if they're quite clinically stable and uh, not having issues um, if there's no urgency. Um, there are some lab agencies that, and home care agencies that will do home draws. Um, so that's always an option uh, to consider as well. And um, for these visits, you also might consider extended intervals between visits for stable patients. Um, it is important for both Hep C and HIV to continue to offer screening, um, even when you're doing telehealth visits, um, even if they're not going to go for their labs for a couple of months, um, still go ahead and talk about the screening, order the screening so that it, so that's there and, and we increase the screening rates in our region. Um, for HIV visits for the new diagnosis, this is really ideally done in person. It's, it's quite complex, requires um, uh, sort of intense counseling, um, rapid initiation of antiretroviral therapy, um, and a, a very sort of close examination. And so, so ideally, you would you would do that first visit in person. Um, but maintenance is is done quite well and efficiently um, by telemedicine if needed. And um, although your first ART prescription is 30 days, your follow-up prescriptions can certainly be um, 90 days for most insurances right now during the pandemic, including Medicaid. And um, try to use pharmacies that have home delivery options available, with, which many do right now. Um, and I don't know if this will be sustained during the coming year, but um, something to keep in mind. Um, for patients um, living with HIV, um, they are disproportionately impacted by the social determinants of health. And so, it, um, especially now when there um, is significant job insecurity, unemployment, and um, the stress of COVID going on, it's important to conduct this screening, um, you know, for depression, anxiety, substance use, food and housing insecurity. Um, to find opportunities to intervene when possible. Um, there are a lot of services available right now. Um, and important for ART and adherence is to ensure that if there's any gaps in insurance or, or ability to obtain medication, that you are aware of it as a provider so that you can intervene and ensure um, they can remain on their ART. This um, table is provided by the AIDS Institute um, in terms of the protocol for rapid initiation of antiretroviral therapy. Um, and I'll really um, just draw you to this um, lab, uh, lab box here, baseline lab testing that's needed. This testing um, it can be done sort of with a combination of um, the in-person visit and a phlebotomy visit um, and some of these things um, can actually be collected by, uh, can be done by home collection, particularly the STI testing. Um, so non-occupational um, post-exposure prophylaxis and PrEP, um, both sort of have their challenges, but again, lots of opportunities for electronic prescription. Um, PrEP is a bit more amenable to telemedicine than PEP, which really needs at least a baseline exam. Um, and then these are really sort of considered essential elements of HIV prevention. Um, so if your clinic um, is not able to offer these services, there are some helplines um, as you see here and um, other sort of platforms for telemedicine where these can be um, obtained and you can refer patients to these areas. And so um, just to finish up with hep C, uh, very similar, as I said, to HIV, but you can consider, um, for example, um, deferring 
treatment if somebody is asymptomatic and um, has low risk for transmitting to others, or treatment is actually very, uh, treatment of hep C very amenable to being done by telemedicine um, as long as the patient can go for labs. And um, medications are already really done by home delivery for hep C. Um, so, so really something that can be easy to do if needed. And so here are just some references. Um, we have non-traditional um, testing options for HIV. The New York State is doing a home test giveaway program for HIV tests. And also for a short time, they are including um, STI testing with this. And then for Trillium, um, which is located, it's a clinic located in Rochester, New York, um, who we have um, sometimes referred patients to for screening. Um, the patient can go to this Trillium website and fill out a survey. Uh, the kit will be mailed to the patient free of charge. They collect specimens in their home, send them back to the lab again in a prepaid um, package, and um, the testing is free. Um, actually, I should mention the Trillium program is available to any resident of New York State. So anywhere in Western New York, if a patient um, is seeking testing for HIV or STIs, you can refer them to this. Um, and here, um, if you're interested, is a, this is a Kaiser uh, Permanente website that um, shows you the options for STI testing by state. You can filter, um, and these are some of the telehealth platforms and just STI platforms for testing um, commercially. Um, this is an example of my lab box, and you can see these are extremely expensive and pretty cost prohibitive for most patients. And these are some clinician resources. So here um, I refer to quite a few of these, but um, you can find these for your, for your reference. Um, and then here is um, what Lisa was mentioning earlier. There are some um, specific telehealth services. Um, and this is um, one about dis uh, discretion for telehealth, remote communications during the pandemic. And this is a helpline um, for clinicians. Um, staff, the sexual health uh, portion of this is staffed by myself and Margie Urban. Um, so if you have a question about, you know, a patient that you're seeing um, with regard to any of these things that uh, HIV, Hep C, STIs, PEP and PrEP, you can call this number, they'll direct you to the right center um, and a provider can certainly um, assist you with some uh, educational information. That's all. Thank you so much, Daniela. That was great information. I, I know we're, we're a little bit past our time, but I did have a quick question for you. It, it seems like I'm, I'm so surprised by the, by the huge increase that you mentioned at the beginning of the, the session and wondering if you had any explanation for that. Um, for, for all STIs? Or for the 75% for the increase that oh, you mentioned. Yes, um, for gonorrhea. So um, we think that part of that is related to starting extra genital testing, which wasn't being done on a, on a large scale before. Um, so that is definitely increasing the volume of gonorrhea tests done. So increasing the number of positive tests. We hope to have some denominator population data for that, um, which I think will help us quite a bit. We know that in um, the uh, population or the community of people um, who identify as men who have sex with men, um, in, in trans women, we want to ensure extra genital testing because when you don't do that, you do miss you know, up to 70% of STIs. And so it's important to do that. Um, the other thing is just that there's more gonorrhea. Um, with the uh, pandemic, uh, public health representatives who usually do the partner services work for, for STIs and HIV have been mostly redeployed to COVID contact tracing and not right. STI contact tracing. And so um, right now there's probably, there is quite a bit less of that going on and the cases um, will, sort of likely continue to increase, um, but we can continue to work on that and, and improve. But in terms of the background increase, I'm not sure uh, any, any additional reasons why we might be seeing that. Well, thank you so much, um, both Daniela and David. We, we really appreciate you taking the time today. Everyone is so busy these days that it's much appreciated. So thank you and thank you everyone who is on today. Um, 
don't forget next week is our self-care for first responders and healthcare professionals, Dr. Catherine Cook Catone from UB uh, Graduate School of Education will be here with us to talk about uh, self-care. So have a great day and a great week. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, David.